Good evening, South Jefferson Baptist Church. Welcome to our worship on Wednesday. The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ is an anchor for our soul, that he has gone behind the curtain and into the presence of God. And then the writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's hold fast to our anchor, Jesus Christ, today as we continue in worship. And let's encourage one another to live the Christian lives that our God is calling us to. Let's worship together this evening by singing Christ a sure and steady anchor. Jesus Christ. 
All right, good evening, family. It's uh, good to be together again on uh, this Wednesday evening. I invite you to take out uh, your copy of God's Word. Let's go to 1 Peter uh, chapter 4 uh, together this evening. 1 Peter chapter 4 at, uh, at verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 4 uh, verse 1. I appreciate Jacqueline opening us in worship tonight, leading us to the throne of grace uh, through the sung word and uh, the theology that we sing together. I'm grateful that we are uh, theologically confessional in the way that we praise our King of kings and Lord of lords. I know that you're grateful for that too. So join me in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Peter is, <clears throat> is still trying to encourage believers. His whole letter the, of, of 1 Peter is a letter of encouragement to believers who are uh, scattered across uh, uh, the Roman Empire experiencing persecution because of their faith. And he's writing uh, to encourage people like you and like me who have faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord, but who are also enduring hardship and sufferings because of their faith. And so he's helping us understand, uh, one, that, that Christ's suffering was really the, the pathway that, that Christ traveled uh, to gain victory and ultimately exaltation. So Christ. Uh, a journey through uh, a period in life, uh, a pathway of suffering that brought him ultimate victory. And, and then it makes sense that, that believers uh, should resolve to suffer. Peter, want, it, he's really encouraging us uh, not to run from suffering, but to embrace suffering because of our faith. Because when we suffer as believers, we try, try to not avoid suffering or sidestep it because of our faith. It shows the world that, that sin has lost its power over us. And that, that's just a powerful testimony for a believer to demonstrate that I'm willing to suffer because of my faith in Jesus Christ. And that willingness to endure persecution because of our faith, it speaks to the lost world around us. And it, it, it demonstrates to the lost world that sin has lost its power in our lives. But it also encourages other believers as other believers watch us endure and persevere through suffering. And, and, and these are not easy words to hear. These are not easy concepts uh, to think about. So that, that Peter would be encouraging us to embrace a life of suffering. And that's because, uh, really, we're not in the midst of suffering right now. Not for our faith. We are suffering, of course, in our country and around the world uh, because of the coronavirus. But, but very few of us, particularly in the United States, or around the world, it's a little bit different, but in the United States, we rarely uh, suffer severe or intense persecution because of our faith. But if we were suffering for our faith, if we were being mistreated and being mishandled and, and being abused because of our faith, what Peter has to say here in this passage would be an encouragement to us because he's explained to us that because Christ suffered, we should also expect to suffer. And knowing that Christ endured all the suffering that he endured uh, while living on this earth, that, that we are, uh, what we're doing uh, for us, uh, endures strength into our life, builds strength into our life, and it, uh, it strengthens our testimony to the lost world around us and to other believers. And so if we were suffering intensely for our faith, this would be really good news for us. And so Join me in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. We find this. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Notice that that arm is a military word. Um, it says arm, arm yourselves also with the same attitude because whoever suffers in this body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather... For the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans do, choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached to those who are even now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God uh, in regard to the spirit. That word therefore really launches us, in verse one, that word therefore really launches 
uh, us the, an understanding of the importance of this passage. And this passage for us, for, for suffering believers, it, it draws on the conclusion about the significance of Christ's victories. And so uh, chapter 3 closed, uh, lifting really and magnifying uh, Christ's victories uh, upon the cross and upon vacating the tomb and leaving it empty. And his death and resurrection handed him uh, the definitive victory over forces of sin and over forces of evil. And so when Peter says, therefore, he, he's really drawing from the things that he said before about Christ's victory, about Christ's triumph, as it relates to Christ himself, but also what it means for us as believers uh, of the living God. And when you read this, it, it makes us wonder why then that, that Peter would tell us to arm ourselves. Now that's a military word that he says to arm ourselves with the same attitude. So he's, he's telling us to be prepared for some type of warfare. The only time you arm for war or arm yourselves in a military fashion is when a conflict uh, is anticipated. And so Peter is helping us understand, telling us to, that we must be armed or to be prepared. And then he helps us understand that it's for unjust suffering and unjust abuse because we're Christian. And, 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 and this is in the, the context of Christ's suffering. Certainly Christ's suffering uh, was unjust. And certainly the abuse that he experienced uh, was, was unjust. And so Peter is helping us understand that we need to prepare ourselves to arm ourselves with the proper attitude to endure, to persevere through unjust uh, suffering, unjust punishment, unjust treatment. And he's telling us this so that we will not be unprepared. If we're not prepared for, for warfare, and this would be a, a, a mental warfare because suffering, yes, it can be physical, but it's also it can be very mental, can be very uh, emotional and, and psychological. And so he's telling us that, telling us these things so that we will not be unprepared so that when the suffering does happen, that we won't be taken off guard by it, that we will have already armed ourselves with the proper attitude to persevere through suffering that's brought upon believers by non-believers. And uh, th th this word arm, you know, it is a military word. And Peter is comparing the Christian life really to that of a warrior, to military personnel. And anytime you would think about arming yourself for a military conflict, and then you think about arming yourself for a physical, emotional, psychological, suffering kind of conflict, then we need a particular kind of discipline to uh, be prepared to arm ourselves for that, that suffering. We need a particular kind of <clears throat> determination and really, uh, a really uh, an attitude of just pure grit in our heart to cling tightly uh, to our profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord while enduring persecution and hardship. And why? Because we should expect to suffer. And Peter's trying to help us understand that because of your faith in Jesus Christ, because of that one reality, because of that one truth, we should expect to suffer. None of us want to think about suffering. Suffering is not something that we would enjoy, but it's what we should expect. Now, what about this phrase that, that Peter uses? He says, because whoever suffers uh, in the body is done with sin. Now, honestly, I, I, I know uh, lots of believers, including myself, who battle and struggle with sin in its various forms. And so what Peter says here, in verse 1, that because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. That, that's an intriguing thought. And he's not trying to teach us uh, that we are above sin. I mean, it's hard to imagine how a believer might be done with sin in this life in such a way that we're never hampered by sin, that we would never be tempted to succumb to sin, that we would never commit a sin, whether in thought or in deed. So Peter, he's not saying or teaching that believers are sinless. Certainly, if you think back to the last uh, two Sunday sermons, 
uh, out of 1 Samuel and through the last few weeks of uh, that we've been in 1 Peter, <clears throat> he's not at all saying that, that once we accept Christ, that we will no longer sin. And we know that that's not true. Uh, you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, there are occasions in your life when you commit sin. Some of those sins are willful. Some of those sins are accidental. But we still commit sins. So, so Peter is not saying that believers are never will, will never reach a point where they're above sin. But what he is trying to help us understand is that to the lost and watching world, watching a believer as they suffer for their faith, maybe even experiencing suffering from the hands of that non-believer watching us uh, suffer for our faith. He's trying to tell us that, that the, the lost and, and watching world and that other Christians who are watching us, our willingness to suffer is proof that we are indeed uh, believers in Lord Jesus Christ. It's an authentication of our faith when we endure suffering for our faith, that we don't run from that suffering. And yet in that faith, we, it, because we're willing to suffer, it's proof to the world that my faith is so authentic, that it's so genuine, that I'm willing to suffer for it. And it authenticates our faith in a way uh, that, that could not be authenticated. And it's, it's through our faith in Christ that we have triumphed over the, the penalty of sin. And so for us, because we have triumphed over the penalty of sin, Peter can say that whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. We're done with sin in that we will no longer suffer the eternal penalty for our sin because that the price for that penalty, the judgment for that penalty uh, of sin in our life has been uh, forgiven and paid for ransom by the sacrifice of of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Let's look at verse 2. Peter writes, As a result, they, speaking of suffering believers, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desire, but rather for the will of God. So there's, there's two ways to live human life. We can live human life pursuing personal desires, personal pursuits, and many of those Peter describes as evil human desires, and he gives a list of what some of those uh, might be a, a little later in this passage. So that's one option. The other option is that we can live uh, to please and to validate uh, God's will in our life. Now, because of our faith in Jesus Christ and our willingness to endure suffering because of that faith in Jesus Christ, because we certainly wouldn't want to walk away. We would not want to profess faith in Jesus Christ and then live life as if we were not professing uh, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that professing Christ as Lord has a definite impact upon our eternity, but it also has a definite impact upon how we live our daily lives, how we conduct our business, and in the context of Peter, how we manage, endure, persevere through suffering. And so because of our faith, we are willing to endure uh, suffering for that faith, and in that suffering, because of our faith, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, who authenticated uh, his triumph and victory over all things evil by leaving the tomb empty there on Easter Sunday by rising from the dead, that because of all that wrapped together, we determine to live our lives for God and for his glory every single day. Now that has definite impacts upon a watching world because if we are walking away from particular uh, life choices, from particular behaviors, from particular habits, from particular routines, to embrace the will of God, walk away from the evil human desires, uh, as Peter identifies them, to embrace and live out God's will, that speaks to the world around us. Remember, it's God's will that none would be lost, that all would come to faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And certainly we know that not everybody will because wide is the gate that leads to destruction and narrow is the gate that leads to life. And, and scripture says it's only a few that find uh, that gate. So that means that everybody's searching for the way to eternal bliss, eternal uh, heaven and, and, and to be with God, but not everyone's gonna find it because they're gonna miss that narrow gate. But we have walked through that narrow gate through our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and the world takes notice of that. It takes particular notice of that 
in our times of suffering and in our desire and ability and determination to walk away from human evil desires. Look at verse 3. He says, For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do. And Peter's confessing. We all, and remember, he's talking about people that lived in this part of the world. And people that lived in this part of the world apparently enjoyed their sin. And they enjoyed engaging in multiple levels of immorality. And he's going to give a list of them. And so he says here in verse 3, that for you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. And he gives a list. Pagans choose to live in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Now that's not all of the immoral things that that uh, lost people engage in or pagan people engage in. And it's not to be a comprehensive list, but just to help us understand the, 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 the low level of evil human desires that that it is it, it's it, it's a very low uh, way of, of living life and so basically he's saying that we have abandoned or at least we are expected to have abandoned the former way of life and that, that we are no longer pagan people that we now live for God and, and the lifestyle of believers and, and non-believers what Peter's trying to point out is that they're dramatically different. That you should be able to very quickly look at how someone is living their life and make almost an instant uh, assessment about whether they know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Because you should be able to look at, at a person's life and they should smell differently, talk differently, walk differently, work differently, engage in uh, leisure activities uh, differently. Uh, all it all should be different when we come to Christ, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as, as Savior and, and Lord. And the people that, that Peter wrote to were very different than most Americans. Most Americans don't live, at least not in the Bible Belt, don't live at these sub levels uh, of, of debauchery. Uh, for us, when we come to Christ, most of us come out of uh, stable homes, stable communities, stable environments, um, stable places uh, of living. Not everybody's wealthy, not everybody is poor, but most homes are relatively stable. You have electricity, you have running water, you have pe people in the home who, who care for one another. And so the way we, we live is very different than the way people lived uh, that were scattered across the Roman Empire. They were true pagans, worshiping and uh, false deities, and they were living lives without restraint in any form. And Peter wants us to understand that, that, that the people of that day were living without any moral restraint. They just did whatever they wanted to do, however they wanted to do it, whenever they wanted to do it, and there were absolutely no restraints, no reins. They just did whatever they wanted to do. And, and as we can see from this list of, of pagan behaviors, that the behaviors of these Christians who were formerly pagans was really awful. And Peter is saying, listen, you don't live that way anymore. You don't smell that way. You don't talk that way. You don't act that way. You don't recreate that way. You are not that same person that you have now abandoned that former way of life. And you've abandoned that former way of life for God's glory, which we want to look at these people and say, well, I'm not that bad. I never lived life that awfully, <clears throat> but in truth, sin is sin is sin. And when we look at our own life, the way we were living life, our lives, prior to accepting Christ as Savior and Lord should be dramatically different today, particularly if we came to Christ as an adult or as an older teenager, uh, because we would, by that time would have already engaged in some immoral behavior and immoral activities. Uh, Whereas, you know, if a person comes to Christ as a young child, maybe they don't have uh, those memories and those stories. That, but if we came to Christ as a, an older teenager or an adult, certainly we would have behaviors in our former life that would been, have been distasteful for a Christian <clears throat> to be engaged in. And so Peter is telling us that as you're suffering, and you're suffering because of your faith in Jesus Christ, to realize that, that 
that it's a testimony to other Christians, it's a testimony to the world that you are a different person. Look at verse four. In verse four, he writes, they are surprised, speaking about lost pagan people, people who do not know Christ their Lord and Savior. <clears throat> he says, they are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living and they heap abuse upon you. Or these are people that certainly speaking about adults coming to Christ as Savior and Lord, and as adults you were, gain, you were engaged in immoral behavior, in, in behavior that's absolutely unbecoming to a Christian that would be associated with a pagan lifestyle. And so Peter sounds like he's addressing adults who place faith in Jesus Christ and not children or even teenagers, but, but, but grownups. And as he's addressing these grownups, he says, the, the grown-ups that who remain in the pagan lifestyle, who continue to reject Jesus Christ, are going to look at you, who now is choosing a different lifestyle, and they're going to make fun of you. And they're not going to understand why you refuse to participate in those behaviors in which you were once engaging. And they don't understand the new lifestyle that you're embracing, or why you're embracing the new lifestyle, and why should they? They have not come to faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. They're still lost. And because they're still lost, they don't have the Holy Spirit to guide them, to help them understand. And that's why, for me, when, when Jesus called people to come to him, he never told anybody to get cleaned up first and then come to me. He never said to anybody, you go fix your life and then come to me and we'll work things out. Jesus accepted people just as they were, just like they were. Remember, Christ died for us while we were yet enemies. And so Christ extends his love to everyone where they are in their life in that moment. And in that moment in living, we may be living lives of debauchery or maybe not so bad. But if we're lost, if we've never accepted Christ our Lord and Savior, we do not have the assurance or the gift of the Holy Spirit guiding us, teaching us how to live the Christian life in this pagan world. And so he lets us know in verse four to, to, to inform us so that we're not surprised then when our friends who are still lost, because these are people that are uh, still engaged with us in conversation and perhaps even in community, and so you're still in proximity to one another and you're still around one another. And they don't understand, people who do not know Christ, don't understand why we have made the choices we have to change our lifestyle. And the hope is that by watching us endure suffering, by watching us remain committed to Jesus Christ in the suffering, continuing to share our testimony to the world, a watching world, through our lifestyle choices, Peter is, is helping us understand that the goal then is for our life to be a testimony to the lost so they might come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Let's look at verse 5. Verse 5, Peter writes, <clears throat> But they, speaking about the people who uh, remain lost, pagans, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So speaking about Christ, perhaps God, uh, Peter uh, returns uh, our gaze really to end times. He's reminding us that, that payday's not always Friday, that there is a day of accountability, and that there is a judge who sits upon the throne, and he judges both the living and the dead. And he's helping us understand, reminding us as believers. Remember, Peter's, Peter's writing to believers. And he's in, trying to encourage us to not forget that one day we will give an account before God for our life. And so as lost people persecute you because of your faith, remember God's the ultimate judge. God will make the final determining decision and factor. So don't give up on living the Christian life. Don't give up on the hope that one day the trumpet will sound and Christ will return and call us to be with him in the air and that we will be with the Lord forever uh, from then on. So don't give up on living the Christian life. Even if you're suffering, even if you're being persecuted, even if your lost friends are continuing to ridicule you and make fun of you because you've stopped participating in immoral behavior, because in truth, we're here temporarily. This is not our home. We have a destination in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are sojourners. We're pilgrims. 
just passing through. On our journey through, we may suffer for our faith, but don't give up and don't lose hope. That's how we have verse 6. In verse 6, he says, For this reason the gospel was preached. The gospel was preached for a reason, for a purpose, for an intended outcome that the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, which means they formerly were living, so they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. That's why the gospel is preached to people before they die. And that's what Peter's trying to say here. The time to proclaim the gospel, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, is while people are living. If you read scripture, <clears throat> there's no such thing as post-mortem regeneration. The moment that we breathe our last breath on this earth, our eternal fate is sealed. We are, our eternal fate is e e either sealed in, in eternal hell, where the flame is never quenched and the worm never dies, or our eternal fate is, is sealed and determined that we will be in heaven in God's presence uh, for all eternity. Once we enter one of those two places, there's no redo, there's no undo, there's no retry, there's no retest. There is no such thing as post-mortem generation. If we breathe our last breath on this earth, apart from a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and Savior and Lord, we will spend eternity in hell. That will not change. There are no second chances. There are no do-overs. You won't find that anywhere in Scripture. It's just not there. The gospel has to be preached to the living before they die. That's why Peter writes in verse 6, For this reason the gospel was preached to those who are now dead. They're now dead. But before they were dead, they were living. And while they were living, the gospel was preached to them so they would have the opportunity to either accept Christ as Savior and Lord or to reject him as Savior and Lord. If they accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, then, then, then they will live according to God in regard to the Spirit. If they chose to reject Christ, then they will be judged according to human standards, which sends every person who rejects Christ to an eternal hell. The gospel is to be preached to the living so that upon hearing the gospel, they might respond to it and it might impact their eternity for sure, but also impact our daily lives because the gospel changes people. Scripture tells us that the old is gone and the new has come because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so th these, these, these six verses here in 1 Peter chapter 4 are very meaningful to us and they're helpful to us because believers should resolve to live godly lives centered on God's will for all of our days because our eternal destination, our eternal security has been established and it's in heaven. And because that we know that we're just passing through, that our eternal home is in heaven, then we can endure suffering and not give up. Even if our former friends who are remain pagans ridicule us, cause us to suffer, bring harm into our life, we've got to remember and understand that God has the final say. We will all stand before him. And because we will all stand before him as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, our lifestyles need to change. It needs to reflect a godly way of living and not a way of living that uh, would exemplify the evil desires of this pagan world. So for us, it's a very encouraging passage because it lets us know that as you endure suffering, there is hope. And the hope that we have should come from a changed attitude. And that attitude we saw in verse 1 is a, a matter of arming ourselves as if for warfare. And so all of this really is spiritual warfare. Spir being prepared for the suffering, being prepared for the ridicule, being prepared for the change in lifestyle, being prepared with the understanding that, that God's the final judge, we have the final say, and that there's a day of judgment coming. We, our attitude should be strengthened and encouraged in a very powerful way. And so we can understand why Peter would use that word arm, to arm ourselves with a proper attitude for suffering. Anyway, God bless you. Thank you for being with me tonight. Uh, we'll join in verse 7. Peter starts off by saying the end, the end is near, that we can see it approaching. You can all even feel it. And we'll pick up there next Wednesday. 
But thank you for joining with me tonight. I pray that uh, our, our study of these verses has been a blessing to you, an encouragement to you, uh, to know that, that your suffering is real, uh, but it won't have the final say. God is the ultimate judge. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I thank you for grace and mercy. I thank you that uh, you give us passages like this to equip us and prepare us so that we're not caught off guard by suffering and by ridicule for our faith. I thank you that we're not caught off guard, that payday's not always on Friday, that uh, you will vindicate uh, believers, that you will judge uh, those who have rejected your son, and you will judge those who have caused believers to suffer for their faith. I thank you for that encouragement. I thank you that as your child that we have an eternal home in heaven uh, awaiting for us and we will forever be with our Lord. Father, thank you. We praise you and surrender to you tonight as our King of kings and Lord of lords. And it's your son's name that I pray. God bless you. Well, what a blessing it is to worship our Lord and Savior together. Thank you for joining us today. We gather together for worship every Sunday at about the same time. The videos are published around 10.30 on Sunday. And we get together Wednesday around 6.30. We invite you to join us at those times. We want you to experience the power of God's presence in your life. Our deep desire is that we worship in spirit and in truth. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Thank you for singing. Thank you for listening. Thank you for praying. God bless you.